Hello. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Rendell. I'm the project manager of the Appropriate Scale Mechanization Consortium. It's my pleasure to be here speaking with you today for the three-part webinar series, Making Extension and Outreach Trainings Gender Sensitive. Uh, this webinar series is hosted by the Appropriate Scale Mechanization Consortium, ASMC, and Integrating Gender and Nutrition Within Agricultural Extension Services Projects. Um, take you over the three-part webinar series. Today is part one, uh, Basics of Effective Training. Part two, How to Train the Right People, will be on May 21st. And part three, Great Facilitation, will be on May 25th. So we want to thank you all for joining us today, but also in, want to encourage you to invite others to join for parts two and three. Any colleagues who you think might be interested in the content from these three webinars, we would more than welcome to join us and encourage them to join us. Three speakers today will be myself, uh, project manager for the ASMC, Andrea Bone, associate director of the Integrating Gender and Nutrition Within Agricultural Extension Services Ingenious Project, and Maria Jones, project specialist for the Ingenious Project. A quick outline for today's talk. Uh, we're going to start with what, so what, and now what. So what, why, why is being gender sensitive important? And we'll, we'll talk about that. And so what, why does it matter to you? Why does it matter to different projects? And why does it matter to others to be gender sensitive? And, and now what, now that you know the importance of um, being gender sensitive, how can you act on that? How can you make your training events more gender sensitive? What action steps are you excited to try as a result of this webinar series? So before we get started into the content, I just want to start with this what question, you know, what are we talking about today? And, and this question is, why is being gender sensitive important? So please feel free to type your comments in the chat box. Hope we want this webinar to be interactive. So typing in the chat box and, and providing input is very important here. So thank you all for your, your willingness to participate right away. Oh, Andrea, thank you. We have a diversity of perspectives. If we leave out major parts of the population, we get very one-sided views. Shahana, to get benefit of the project proportionally from both men and women. Excellent. It's important because input from women allows us to see a fuller picture of the problem we are trying to solve. It makes us consider more perspectives. These are, these are great, and I'm glad that we're starting to use the chat box to interact. Um, so, why is being gender sensitive important? There are a lot of gender barriers in ag. Uh, they, women lack access to land. Women lack access to credit. Lack access to inputs and technologies. Lack access to extension services. Lack access to markets lack autonomy and agency and decision-making, have limited education. These are different barriers that women will face and that projects will have to take into consideration when developing solutions that are suitable for both men and women. So what? Why does it matter to you? How have gender barriers, barriers affected your work? Again, I would like you to please Type in comments in the chat box here. Andrea, to be honest, at times I've been really annoyed at the few men who dominate the discussions at training. 
That's a very good point. So that's a that's a barrier that's affecting our work where men are dominant of the stage or time during trainings and are taking up time. Sakar wrote, in Nepal, females are less likely to be involved in trainings and there's much less access to land and access to rights, which is very important. Sociocultural barriers have affected your work in Excellent. Well, thank you for continuing to use the, the chat box. Women can be an input, important source of change and innovation. And it can be very difficult at times to get women into trainings. Well, I'm, I'm glad that these are, these are coming out in this, this webinar series because that's the point of the webinar series is to learn tips and strategies to engage women and start to break down some of the gender barriers when you're holding training events. So moving forward, um, some of these barriers lack access to land. Uh, technologies or approaches that require land or land ownership might not always be appropriate for female farmers because they do not have access to land. So that's something that needs to be considered when developing technologies or new solutions or approaches that are supposed to be gender sensitive. Um, lack of education is a barrier. Um, access to information and knowledge to adopt technology, um, something that should be considered when developing solutions and, and trying to be a gender sensitive program. Lack, lack of credit makes it harder for women to access technologies or buy inputs like fertilizers or, or, or improved seed, um, something that should be considered when you're looking at um, gender sensitive trainings programs. Um, time is a limited commodity for female smallholder farmers. Um, so solutions should reduce the burden on women's time and labor, not increase. That's something that projects need to be, make sure they're accounting for that we're not overburdening women's time by introducing any new technology or approach. So what, what are the importance of gender sensitive programs? Uh, being gender sensitive and breaking down the barriers for gender and ag can improve food security and poverty reduction outcomes, improve household nutrition, health and education, remove discriminatory beliefs and practices, as well as improve efficiency of business, ensure the flow of quality goods and create new business opportunities. So now we'll go into the bulk of our presentation today. Now what? How can you make your technology and extension trainings gender sensitive? So to start, we're gonna start a poll. Um, and I'll ask that you guys answer the questions in the poll. So question one, have you held any events in the past three months? Question two, approximately how many men attended the training? Question three, approximately how many women attended the training? And question four, did you face any gender barriers with the training? If you have any questions how to answer the poll, please let us know. All right, we'll share results of the poll. 
So 10, 10 people responded to the poll, which we could have done better, but that's okay. Um, have, have you held any training events in the past three months? 60% um, have. Um, approximately how many men attended the training? More men than women. And did you face any barriers or challenges in getting equal participation? Well, despite that no is the greater answer, the numbers seem to say that that might be the case. <laughs> um, taking you into the outline for the rest of the talk, we'll be giving tips on how to hold um, effective and gender sensitive training and extension events. Uh, we'll be giving a total of eight different tips outlined here. Tip one, basics of effective training. Tip two, great content. Tip three, great training approaches. Tip four, getting the right people to come. Tip five, making sure the right people can come. Tip six, creating a supportive community. Tip seven, grading great facilitators. And tip eight, after the training. So today we'll focus on the first two tips, the basics of effective training and great content. And with that, I'll introduce Andrea Bone, who will take over the presentation from here on out. Okay. Yeah, hi everybody. Basics of effective training. You know, let's keep in mind that when we ask people to come to one of our training events, we're taking them away from very busy lives full of responsibilities. And, and who's more busy than the women farmers we know, right? So here's the first four tips um, to make training effective. Make it fun, create leadership and decision-making opportunities, treat both men and women as teachers and innovators, and walk your talk. So what does that actually mean? So the first picture I'm showing you, pay attention to how many people are standing around and smiling and everybody's engaged. You know, there's some action happening on the table. There is a very pensive young man uh, reflecting on what is on that plate in front of him. And everybody else is paying attention. And if you see somebody pull out a, a smartphone and take a video, it must be something that's relevant and shareable. So a um, little tip for you, when you uh, do trainings, have somebody else take lots of photos and maybe some video. And after the event, do take time as a team and, and look over those photos. Uh, are people engaged? Are they smiling? Are they paying attention? Uh, do you just have men do something and, or just have women do something? Are they doing things together? Um, the, the photos will really tell a story and you want to looking back at your, your training videography and photos is a good way to verify for yourself whether you've achieved uh, that aim of making it fun and engaging. The next picture is about a, a group of six people singing a song. You know, I, I'm not a good singer myself and I'm very, very shy when it comes to singing in public. But I'm always amazed how um, this little tool of having participants um, as a team, uh, working in a small group, write a song that captures what they've learned at the training so far, and then, you know, develop a tune to it and then sing it out loud. This is so much fun. And, and people love doing it. I, again, I'm always impressed. This really, really works. Uh, by the way, the two pictures you just saw, saw are from... Um, a training that we've been doing in Ingenious, we call it the introductory uh, training on gender and nutrition. And at the, uh, the resource page, there's some links to that. So if you want to have an example of a training manual and training tip sheets that showcase what techniques you may be using to make an, uh, a training event fun and engaging, you can turn to those. So here's a list of some examples that you can, you can, how you can make events engaging and fun. So case studies. Hey, case studies is something we use at the university all the time. It's a really effective and interesting and fun way to learn. 
Use storytelling, role plays. Um, use energizers, songs and dance. You just saw the picture about how we've been using songs in training. Um, think about letting people really do something. Uh, don't just demonstrate standing in front of the class the way we had it when you were in school, but let people touch things, play with things, move things, um, be creative, draw posters, uh, arrange, arrange symbols, do drawings. Um, a no-brainer if you do nutrition training, you know, have people there to eat, touch, feel, cook. So often as trainers, we think it's about us coming in as the experts and telling everybody else what to do. But you all know very well that it, among your trainees, you often have very experienced, smart people who've got something to share. And they also lend credibility to what you're talking about. Engage community members who can inspire participants. If they identify with the person standing in front of them, if it's somebody they've had lots of fun with in the past, you know, this, this makes it a fun and engaging event. Um, but you have to be a little careful. You know, sometimes if you have too much fun, it, it could uh, go into the point where maybe somebody is being made fun of, if there's ridicule, if there's sexist jokes. So you want to avoid that and you want to avoid uh, putting participants on the spot. You have to have a lot of empathy as a trainer who is serious about engaging uh, all the trainees. Watch out if somebody is not comfortable. And um, again, the last bullet point here is liberating structures. Um, I wonder how many people have used that in, in the past. It'll come up again in the um, sessions next week. And at the end of the uh, slide deck, we also have a link to liberating structures. Some of the people on this webinar today, I actually know in person, and um, you may have had a chance to experience liberating structures with me. Anyway, I just put that, want to put that word out there. It's, it's a set of facilitation techniques that are really designed to engage um, and uh, unleash everyone. So there's techniques out there, and um, our slide deck at the end also includes a handbook on participatory training, specifically focusing on, it, on gender examples. So while this is a long list that you see here, don't worry, at the end of the slide deck, there is a link to various resources. And if you, I would encourage you, if you've not used um, uh, engaging methods, try one or two the next time you are involved in the training. Observe other trainers and see how, what they do to make the event fun and engaging. The other is about creating leadership and decision-making opportunities. You know, all too often we think that we as trainers have to do it all. Um, and that we're talking at people instead of getting people to talk among themselves. We, we may always pick the same people that we're familiar with, who may be, you know, a village leader whom we know. Um, this picture I took in Bangladesh a few years back, and I was simply amazed at that young woman who was holding the papers in her hand. She stood up and spoke with such confidence about the things that concern her, uh, ideas that she had. I encourage you to um, involve uh, people who are sometimes marginalized in your training. Give them a little space. It doesn't have to be on the front of the stage and speaking you know, to 400 people sitting in the room, but design in such a way that um, they can facilitate small group discussions. Um, ask women to make presentations on behalf of their groups. And, you know, sometimes, of course, you will have some, some very outspoken people, very often men who are sort of uh, saying something or it, from their facial expression, you can see that they're a little one surprised that you're not ask them to do this. Um, but there's a way you can, you can make it sort of neutral. You know, you can, you can uh, give numbers to people. Let's say you have 20, uh, 20 uh, people in your group and you have them count one, one to four, one to four, one, one to three, four, one to three, four. And then you have all the four, fours in a group and, um, and ask them to vote for, um, to have one of the women in their group speak up. So you sort of, you don't say, I only want, um, that you're not the one pointing out who's going to be doing the talking, that, that they decide who's going to be talking or that you assign a neutral system by which 
um, the speakers are coming up front. And you've always all been in training where a lot of the men are, are talking. Um, specifically ask a woman to respond to a comment that has just been made. I know some of this is culturally very sensitive. And if you're coming from a culture where, especially in public meetings, women are always standing by the side and not, not speaking up, one way to really bridge that and to, to be an agent of change is to allow change to happen in smaller groups. You know, if, if it's two people talking with each other, everybody gets to speak. Break up, break up into small, small groups and encourage discussion. Um, what you, the picture you see here is of a reflection technique called ORIT. And again, we do have a more thorough explanation in the reference section at the end. And here basically two people are discussing a question together and then you give a signal and the whole group, uh, one of the groups shifts so that um, they have another person standing across them. And that way you will have inadvertently sooner or later men talking with women, women talking with men, but you also have men talking with other men about the experience. And if you include a session such as, what did you think of you know, the, the co-facilitator who may have been a woman, um, you will find that maybe they, the men make very interesting discoveries about how very able that co-facilitator managed the session. Or you may have women talking to each other saying, you know, I really admire how she took over and she did such a great job. I think I'm going to try that myself next time. Um, another way is to treat participants at teacher, as teachers. Again, this sounds really scary for us if we're so used to being in control of the situation and looking at ourselves as being the experts. Um, the young woman you see back there with her outstretched arm is my friend Asma. And um, she was going to be just a participant in the training. And, uh, but we recognized the potential in her. And the next time uh, we did a training, we asked Asma to be a co-facilitator. And I'm just amazed at how she picked up a lot of the techniques. And she was a confident woman before, believe me. But uh, she just so intuitively picked up on how to engage her audience. And uh, she became a great facilitator herself. And the lady standing to the um, left of her in the yellow headscarf, you know, she's a participant from the group sitting, sitting beforehand. So Asma passed on what she herself learned, and that is to to pick up a member from the group that is being trained and, and have them co-facilitate a session. So the big message here is be creative and find ways to involve, support and highlight women farmers or you know, um, women businessmen as co-teachers, innovators, have them lead the demonstration don't fall into the trap of um, having the same old, same old people always uh, do that job. My last point is about walking your talk. Be an example, model what you're trying to see. Um, look, at, look at the last 10 trainings you participated in or that you organized. How many women were engaged as trainers and co-facilitators? Make a real effort the next time you're planning an event to make sure that at least one of the trainers or facilitators is a woman. Are you allowing staff in key decision-making positions? How can you expect women farmers to be more confident and empowered and, and start to be recognized as, as people who've got something to show and to share if you're not making that happen in your own organizations? I'm sure you can think of lots of examples where um, exposing people to role models who are maybe have been a little bit unexpected, who then are really empowered to see that marginalized people can really have a lot to contribute, have a lot to say, and, and that they bring unique skills and ideas to the table. So to summarize, we talked about how to make gender responsive uh, training events fun. 
that you should create leadership and decision-making opportunities and work in small groups is a great way to get started on that. Treat both men and women as teachers and innovators and be a role model, walk your talk. And with that, I'm ready to hand over to Maria. Um, you know, how to summarize what I've just talked about. At the end of a training event, you want everybody who attended to say, wow, that was a fun event and I learned so much. So now Maria will talk a, lot, uh, a little bit about what that learning may be about. What, what about the content? How important is that? Thanks, Andrea. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria. And I had a question to start us off into the um, next tip. Um, in your experience, what has been a very memorable training event? And what has made it so memorable? So please take a moment to type your responses in the chat box. And uh, just thinking about this question that was just asked. What has been a memorable training event and what made it so memorable? So we're having the first couple of responses come through. Axon has just uh, mentioned about how he had a great training, which had great takeaways. And um, especially after everything has been said and done, having a good takeaway has been very memorable. Uh, we've also had Tim mentioned about attending a liberating structures training event uh, where he was so energized after the training event that he wanted to immediately try out the tips he's learned. Nanda has mentioned about having when participants are engaged and ask a lot of questions that is a very engaging training um, and especially when participants come up with their own thoughts to share that's a very good point we've had Sir Carl talk about um, where the training in which he thought of farmers about nursery bed preparation it was memorable because it was a practical method applied and the male and female people, uh, farmers were equally participating. That is great. Um, Mindy just spoke about being able to respond to female smallholder farmers in India and offering them a training that was led by a woman versus a man. Thank you, everybody. This is great. Um, and it's memorable because it worked and they were able to replicate it. Thank you very much. That, those are some very great responses. So. We're really learning a lot about participation, right? Um, and encouraging people to participate, giving participants the confidence in trainings to be able to speak up, to take ownership of this event. Now, a huge part about making, um, having an effective training is great content. But how can you make great content? We all know it's important, but here are some three practical ways you can make your content for your training very relevant. Um, the first is collecting information to make your training relevant. It seems very obvious, but it's actually, it takes a little bit more effort to do that instead of having a prescribed training um, event that you already have. The second is to promote technologies and practices as a menu instead of a package. And finally, promote adaptive capacity. And we'll go into these three a little bit more in detail. So let me start with telling you about a case um, in Nigeria. So this was um, done by a specific organization in Nigeria where they were, uh, it was the Cassava Adding Value for Africa project. And as you all know, cassava is usually seen as a woman's crop because of the, um, um, because of the benefits that it has in terms of nutrition as well as financially for women and women are involved in also the commercial processes in um, processing cassava. But in this specific case, what they found out was men and women were involved in different types of cassava value chain. 
um, for instance, specifically in Nigeria, where this project was taking place, there are two types of products that could be made from cassava, um, gari and fufu. And not only were there two types of products that could be made from cassava, the men and the women were involved in different um, parts of the value chain. The men were involved more in uh, the fresh cassava root market because they like to um, sell the roots instead of processing them. And the women were the buyers uh, of these roots and they processed the cassava roots to make gari, especially in this region. So what you see is um, in, if you were to train these men and women, the men have different needs, which is the fresh tuber market, and the women have different needs, which is a processing market and specifically the gari processing market. So we can see that they have different needs uh, and priorities, especially in terms of mechanization, which means that when you are having a training event, it is so important to think about what their needs are and address those specific needs in your content. So how can we do that? A good starting place is to collect information to make your training relevant. Um, you can work with different groups of farmers, finding out what priorities they have, um, identify specific needs and interests, identify also sources of expertise, and then finally address the issue or opportunity. Usually different groups of farmers could be small scale male farmers, small scale female farmers, even landless farmers, youths, there are different types of different groups of farmers, but it's important to know what their specific needs are if you are going to be training them. Additionally, it's also important to know best sources of expertise. Um, and the expertise does not necessarily, um, the usual kind of experts um, at, a, at a university level, it could actually just be an innovative farmer who's already producing um, the crop that you're interested in or marketing specific products. So it's important to consider uh, both of these aspects. Additionally, it's important to look at yourself, if you are the trainer, to think of yourself as a knowledge broker. So you're not telling people what to do, but you're facilitating the teaching learning process amongst all types of farmers. So um, just to again, talk about how to collect information to make your training relevant. The first thing is to find out men and women's priorities in relation to the technology or practice you plan to train them on. Additionally, find out what the members of your target group know, respect that knowledge and build on it. People always understand if you connect it back to something that they already know instead of starting from scratch. Third, work with the ideas of women and men users when designing training events. So again, respecting them as equal participants and not as uh, beneficiaries. Four, conduct focus group discussions. Focus groups are a great way to get people to talk and understand um, um, what their needs are to develop the training content. And finally, it helps to practice. So do try to pilot your event before rolling it out. Um, just one additional point about this. A, lot, a, a good way to see what we're trying to say is to think about a top-down versus a bottom-up approach. Traditionally, training events are designed in such a way that we tell people what to do. It's very paternalistic. It's very top down. We are the experts standing in front of the room telling people what to do and they have to listen to us. However, what we are trying to tell you <laughs> during this webinar is how about having a different stance, have it more participatory, have it bottom up, where you're educating farmers and starting with where they're at and building them up instead of telling them what to do. The next tip we have is looking at um, promoting a menu and not a package. This would be um, specifically relevant if your training events are designed to help farmers adopt new technologies. A lot of times, again, we tell farmers, oh, here's this awesome technology, and this is why you should take this and adopt it right now because this is the best thing that happened to you. However, life is not that simple. We all know that we like choices and especially if we like to compare the pros and cons of every choice. A great example is what a solar lighting company has done um, in East Africa called D-Light. And what D-Light does is they offer different functions, um, sorry, different products which have different functions. For example, the image that you can see there right now, D-Light has the single function which is 
promoted as a study lamp for children. It's a solar light. Um, they also have a multifunction solar lamp, which acts as a mobile charger by day. And many of you might have actually seen that. And finally, they have small power systems to power a small business or even a home, uh, which is multiple lights, a phone, um, and maybe a fan too. So when they go to customers, they never give them one product and tell them this is what you should adopt, but they give them choices and they tell them what the different choices can do for them, which, is, um, which, is, which helps consumers make a decision. So how can you do that in a training? Right. Um, again, in a training, especially if you are promoting technologies or mechanizations, it's important to um, enable participants to select from a range of technologies or practices. Um, again, as I'd mentioned before, build on women and men's existing expertise uh, and especially find, helping them find ways to develop their understanding. And finally, create space for discussion, especially around trade offs between choices. In this age of internet, we all like to look at reviews. We all like to compare and we all like to have choices. And your participants and your trainings need to have the similar choice as well. Finally, promoting adaptive capacity. Um, in order to explain what I mean by promote adaptive capacity, I would like to talk about a simple case, um, which was done by Redco, um, an organization in Uganda. They had created a sweet potato salad chopping machine and that was supposed to make the insulin much more efficient, reduce the drudgery chopping the vines because the people were traditionally using a traditional sickle. However, they were surprised when they had terrible adoption rates. They just couldn't understand why a product that should make life easier for people was not being adopted. And then they found out it's because the women had a fear of the chopper, especially because the children that they had with them during the process of chopping the vines, they were concerned that the blades were readily accessible. Your fingers could actually touch the blades when you were using the machine and they didn't want their kids near that. And hence the adoption rates were terrible for a supposedly good machine. But what makes this case unique is that Vedco, when they realized this, when they found out what the concerns were, they addressed it immediately. The first thing that they did was to add a protection cover so that people did not touch the blades and they could not hurt themselves, especially the children. The second thing they also did was to train a cohort of community members who could operate the missionary. So what this did was it took out um, the fear that women had in operating the missionary by creating specifically trained people to operate the missionary. And besides, they created new employment um, for these community members who would be operating the missionary. And this, this is such a great example of how to promote adaptive capacity. So how do you do that in a training, especially when you're training participants about approaches or technologies? A primary thing you can do is to ask participants how do they think they can adapt the technology of practice? Where are areas of gaps that they see that can be addressed? What are some of the implications of using this technology? Um, specifically, this is called as, um, in many different circles, again, this is called as bottom-up approaches, or sometimes people call it human-centered design approaches. But the, the crux of it is you're taking your participants seriously and you're treating them as partners in the process of this technology and training. So just to give you a quick recap, we spoke about how to make great content. The first thing you would do is to collect information to make your training relevant, especially understanding that you're working with different kinds of farmers and you need to understand what their needs are to make the information relevant in your training. Secondly, promote technologies and practices as men menus rather than packages. Give people choices, let them make an educated guess. You also add to their dignity when they choose a technology that works best for them. And finally, promote adaptive capacity. Farmers um, are experts in what they do and allow them to be a process of, um, in creating the best uh, technology and product and in your training approaches. So next, I'm going to pass it on back to Tim again. Well, 
Thank you, Maria and Andrea, for wonderful presentations. And, and I'm glad that everybody was here to, to listen to them and how engaging they can be and how excellent the content they delivered is. I will do a, a quick recap of our presentation today before we open up to questions and answer sessions. So please, if you have questions, prepare them and have them ready to type into the text box. Um, so when we started the, today, we discussed some of the barriers that females will face within agriculture um, and the benefits of gender inclusive solutions. You know, when, when gender sensitive approaches are taken, we can improve food security and poverty reduction outcomes. We can improve nutrition, health and education at the household level, at the community level. Um, we can remove discriminatory practices and beliefs um, overall, we see economic growth and efficiency in business, um, quality of goods, and, and the ability to, to build new economic opportunities. Um, so what, once we decided that um, and shown the, the value of gender-sensitive training, Maria and Andrea gave just great suggestions and tips on how to, how to make this and take action for gender-sensitivity training. Um, we started with the basics of effective training, making gender responsive training events fun. We can use songs or role playing activities. The goal is when a participant leaves a training, we want it to be memorable. We want them to be energized to try to take what they learned and bring it to their community and, and allow, allow others to learn as well. Um, create leadership and decision making opportunities for females. Um, breaking down into small groups and asking for a female participant to be able to voice the, the response for the entire group um, and being sensitive to um, different cultural barriers that may keep uh, females from participating fully in opportunities and trying to break down those barriers is a great way to approach an effective training. Uh, treat women and men as teachers and innovators. As trainers, we can learn as well as disseminate information. There should be a two-way exchange of knowledge as we are training and, and we need to make sure that we are learning from our participants just as much as they are learning from us. Finally, walk your talk. Um, put women in leadership roles. Have a great woman leader as a facilitator of a training. Um, we need to make sure that if we're telling others that we're, this is how it should be done that we ourselves are doing it that way. And then Maria came with great content um, as the next step for an effective training. Making sure your information is relevant, understanding the priorities of both men and women in the region, and making sure that your training is taking into consideration these um, priorities. Focus group discussions to be able to have an open and honest dialogue within the community to understand what is really needed before you hold a training event. Um, promote technologies and practices as menus rather than packages, giving farmers a choice. Everybody likes to have a choice as opposed to having to say, we need to do it this way. So it's really sh make sure that it's a collaborative experience as opposed to you are being told top down that this is how it's supposed to be. And promote adaptive capacity, making sure that participants are willing to experiment and learn to try new things to improve their livelihoods and this idea that they can continue to grow and adapt to overcome different challenges and trying to change their way of thinking to continue to experiment and learn. So today we, we covered two tips, basics of effective training and great content. In our next training event uh, on May 21st, we'll hold Another three tips, great training approaches, getting the right people to come, and making sure the right people can come. We hope that you all are able to join us for that webinar as well, and please continue to encourage others to join. Please send our invitation out to colleagues who you think will enjoy this webinar series. Um, we want to try to have as many people as possible join us. I'm, I'm excited for our next webinar because we've already done one. So now everybody will know exactly what we're expecting to type into the chat. I'm hoping it could be even more engaging and even more fun. So as a reminder, part two, how to train the right people will be May 21st. 
uh, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And at that point, at this point, we're going to open up to any questions. So if anybody has any questions, please put them into the chat box and we'll start a conversation. And th thank you all for joining today. This was a, a wonderful event. So I, I have a question for the participants. If you have any questions for the panelists, please let me know. Um, are there any examples which we did not provide today on how to make a training event fun? I know that songs and different role playing were mentioned earlier, but are there any examples that you can think of that we didn't um, provide today? So we just got a question on, is there anything we can do to enhance participants who are uneducated? That's a great question because as we mentioned earlier during the webinar, a big gender barrier that does exist is the fact that women tend to uh, be, to have lesser education than men do mostly. And it does affect how you do your trainings. Our suggestions on what has worked in Ingenious in the past is to have this activity-based learning instead of having more written material. And activity-based learning can also include more visual job aids or visual charts and uh, pictures that help communicate the messages that you want to communicate. Um, two specific examples I can tell you about is one, we did a training which Andrea had also mentioned about called the Introductory Gender and Nutrition Training which was meant to be completely um, uh, PowerPoint free. So no PowerPoints, no written words, but it was very active, very activity oriented. And all the um, participants were equally engaged irrespective of their educational level. The second thing I can talk about is job aids. Um, currently we are working in Uganda with farmer based organizations, and we have been able to create materials that do not have words, but instead have pictures and images that teach people about better nutrition practices. So that is our suggestions and how to en um, help enhance your trainings um, with people who are uneducated or have low literacy levels. Andrea, do you have other thoughts? Um, well, I'm, I'm a particularly big fan of videos. Um, and the important thing about videos and actually also photos, it, it's not just to show them and then think people um, get the story, but to also have a discussion of what's being shown in the video. Because it's very easy to have misunderstandings and also uh, people really learn by uh, thinking, talking about what they've seen or heard. So when you are thinking about using videos in your training to, to demonstrate something, be sure to also um, organize for a discussion about the content. Do we have other questions? Okay. Okay. So we have another question by Shahana about what types of training are we talking about, the duration, for whom, by whom, and how will this be applicable well, to appropriate scale mechanization? I mean, I'd like to throw the question back to you. I think this applies for a one hour long session and it applies to a six weeks training program. I think what we try to bring across with this webinar series is some, um, some basic ideas and um, they can, how exactly you can implement them in a short versus a long training is something you have to think through. Use the things we talk about today and the next week, maybe sort of as a checklist as you're designing your short or your long-term training package. Are you, are you taking these general principles and tips into account? And, um, you know, I think there's hardly any development project that doesn't involve a lot of training, widely interpreted. So I would be surprised if there's anybody on this webinar here today who isn't involved on a regular basis in planning um, uh, uh, training events. 
they may not be called training events, but whenever people get together to learn with and from each other, um, the tips that we've shared today and we're going to share next week, I think will be re very relevant. And so Shahana, how does this apply to your particular project? Um, I would encourage a debate about that sometime soon. And an easy way to start is maybe to pick up some of the pictures that were taken at past training events and said, you know, I've been thinking, we can do better than this. So Dr. Harrigan mentioned he thinks it's a very good idea that trainers, facilitators summarize the things that they learn from participants. This will encourage greater interaction in future workshops and build trainee confidence. That's a, that's a great example. Being able to make this a two-way exchange and being able to learn from the participants really starts to break down some of the barriers of maybe a classroom setting where it's knowledge going one way um, and really showing the trainees confidence that what they have is valuable and they need to, we can learn from them just as much as they can learn from us and then we're working together to find a solution. Uh, Andrea and Maria, I have a question for you. Do you have any examples in a training event held by Ingenious where there was a gender barrier that was hard to break yes. down? Yes. And can you, can you speak yes. to that? Yes. Yes. Um, an event comes to mind um, in a Southeast Asian, uh, in a South Asian uh, country where we had uh, researchers and um, uh, government people and some academics, and there was somebody from government and this was a trend that, training that was also about, actually about uh, gender uh, in agricultural development. And this guy was very, very outspoken. And he said, you know, all of the stuff you're talking about just isn't true. You know, there's no issue with gender-based violence. Women have just as many opportunities. And as a trainer, you could just see the women in the room sort of roll their eyes, but they weren't, they were, weren't going to say very much because this guy was pretty high up in the hierarchy. And um, I wasn't a trainer in the event myself. In fact, I, I was only able to participate in part of it. But um, the two trainers who were there were quite experienced. And the way they dealt with this, I'm sorry to say, rather obnoxious, uh, very dominant, and I would like to say almost sexist person, is that they gave him tasks to do, <laughs> which he did with great diligence. <laughs> and so he was sitting in a corner working on an assignment, and finally other people had to talk. It's really difficult to manage somebody who is uh, very loud and outspoken and dominant. And it isn't just when you talk about gender, it could be on other matters as well. So the person who thinks he's smarter than everybody else, he's more important than everybody else. And uh, you're not going to be successful if you confront somebody like that head on, but a nice way uh, to divert it is to, um, uh, to take that person to the side, give that person a special assignment, uh, break it up into smaller groups. So if you if you have a room with 40 people and you structured the training so that only one person can be talking at a time, then a dominant personality can really take over. Uh, so one way to to quickly deal with the situation is to say, and now we're going to do some group work, you know, mm -hmm. break up into groups of four or five and here's what you want to work on because then that person can only annoy four other people in the smaller group. But this this happens a lot. This happens a lot. That's actually a great point. And I have a very similar case um, in West Africa, training on gender and nutrition, where we had a similar faculty member who stood up and said, well, I don't think women should be given any sort of power in, um, in with respect to men, because if the women are given power, they'll grow horns and <laughs> they will not listen to men anymore. Um, and very similar to what Andrea mentioned, the women in the room obviously did not agree to what the man said. In fact, many men also did not agree. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. people in such group settings are afraid to stand up mm -hmm. and speak out what they think. But here's where being a great facilitator comes into place. Um, in this case, a facilitator um, next made a point, instead of her 
telling the people what to do or what to say, she encouraged only women to stand up in the room and speak their mind about or respond back to this comment. And she also encouraged young men, youth, to stand up and speak in response to this comment. And we found that there were great responses. There was no need for an external mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. facilitator come and put in their points. There, the women in that room and the young men in the room also were able to speak up and say why they did not agree with the older gentleman's comments. And here is how they felt there could be more equity in their, um, in their specific situation and community. So yes, there, there have been very difficult circumstances, but with um, good practices, we, mm -hmm. can, we can take these bad circumstances and make them good, <laughs> make them better or a great learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Andrea and Maria. Those were great examples. Um, it comes to mind that when we, when we discuss gender, it may be considered a female-dominated field. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very important for men to realize that it's, it's part of their job as well in, in terms of looking at gender sensitivity. So when we are working in countries, how do we work with different directors and, and really engage males to be looking at this and, and trying to break down the silos of gender is a female dominated area and males work at this and working together to combat some of the barriers faced, not only with gender, but other project areas that gender constraints are there as well. So if the men are working on technology adoption, there, there's definitely a gender component that needs to be considered. So how do we kind of bridge the gap and try to break down these silos? Something that's worked for me is really to, if somebody has a very different opinion from me and is really resistant, my job first is to really listen, understand where that person is coming from. And maybe just like the example Maria gave, instead of me telling that person, um, I don't like your opinions or you're wrong, is to see if there's somebody else who's maybe more familiar with that person, with that cultural context and say, you know, is there an example of where the situation actually was better? Can you think of a champion? Um, have, have you, let's think about an example where um, uh, empowering women actually had a better outcome for everybody. So you're sort of throwing back the question, you're listening and you're not saying, oh, you're so right, of course, yeah, but rather, hmm, I understand where you're coming from. Um, but there's often examples of how things are changing and to have somebody who's so resistant to change actually acknowledge that change is happening and talk that through is that who, the, the change in leadership, um, um, maybe women doing jobs that are typically reserved for men, was that really so bad? What, did all the fears that I hear your, are embedded in your opinion, in your beliefs, did they really come true? And to have more of a, dis listen, have a discussion, uh, try to bring counter examples to the surface that that person can't deny or, or maybe is an eye-opening experience for that person. And, um, and also take it away from, often people are really threatened personally by these things. And I think it helps to focus on what it is that we want to achieve. Our goal is not to um, have Amazonians rule the world, <laughs> but our role is for the outcomes to be better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a good example is in raising children. So in many societies, um, men have much less care responsibility than women. And um, it's a real burden for women. They have so many things to do and they love taking care of their kids and their older family members, but there's all these other obligations. And it is amazing when men start taking on some care responsibilities, their lives become richer. And there's so many examples of that. And often men fear that if they take on, uh, whether it's in farming or in the household or in society or in the economy at large, if they take on things that women have been doing, thereby relieving women and, you know, giving them a bit more space <laughs> and more time, um, that other men will look down, will look down on them. Um, and it's hard to be the change maker, but it's also very empowering when you've then experienced it. And we see this in a lot of Western countries where men are taking on more and more care responsibilities and they find their lives richer for it. So the goal is not to disempower men uh, and, and to make women the, the most powerful and leaders of the world, but it's about 
individually and at the community level finding an even better way of doing things. And that's not something as an outsider I can or should tell people to do. I think it's more about the discovery and trying things out. I think this is about encouraging, trying, trying it on a small scale, doing things a little differently. And, and Axon just made a, a great comment in the chat box. It's never been men against women or women against men, but men and women and women and men together, working together as equal partners in development. And, you know, everybody has something to bring to the table and contribute to their household, to their community. Um, and breaking down the barriers that divides us mm -hmm. brings us towards unity. So very well said, Axon. Thank you. So if there are, are any more questions, you can continue to write them into the chat box. Um, one question we asked earlier was, are there, are there any examples on how to make um, training events fun that we did not include in the, the presentation? Um, and one, one answer was um, provide recognition and reward, keep them short but meaningful, tell stories, and accommodate different learning styles. And I think that's, that's very well said. So if you guys do have any more questions, please feel free to, to email us. Um, emails are, are located on this slide here. We will be providing a copy of the slides um, and some reference material. So thank you all for joining us. Um, with that, we will say goodbye and we hope to see you next Monday and next Friday. And please do pass on this webinar series to your colleagues and friends. We want to make sure that everyone is able to participate and we will make these videos available online as well. Thank you all for joining this morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where we are in the world and hope to see you again soon.